Well, um, uh, please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker. Hugh Lacey is a senior research scholar and professor emeritus at Swarthmore College and a research fellow at the University of Sao Paulo. Um, he is, uh, I think, one of the most important people writing on the topic of uh, science and values. So he's a very important position in that debate, and uh, I'm really glad that he would come and uh, speak at this uh, conference. So without further ado, you may see. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, thanks for the invitation to be here. It's uh, been a real pleasure. I've enjoyed lots of the sessions and I've enjoyed many conversations. Today, th there's pretty general agreement in the science values literature that although values often distort scientific activities by, for example, introducing <coughs> biases and conflicts of interest, nevertheless, they have legitimate, inalienable, non-alienable roles within them. That still leaves plenty of room for controversy about what those roles are or should be, uh, what values are actually playing the roles, and where within scientific activities, and whether other values could play them equally as well or even better, and about whether it is of the nature of science to reflect and strengthen certain specific moral and social values such as progress. Now, I maintain that there are deep connections between, uh, between adherence to substantive ethical and social values and how we think about scientific methodology and about what phenomena should be among the objects of scientific inquiry. And today, I don't propose to prove that point, but to open up discussion about it. And I will do so by providing an illustration by how it might be the case by way of addressing the question, what kinds of scientific investigation, in which disciplines, of what phenomena, using what kinds of methodology, are needed in order to inform adequately programs, policies, and farming practices aiming to safeguard food security for everyone? First, a few brief comments on science and scientific methodology, and then on food security. Science and scientific methodology. I take it that how science is to be understood is a matter of contestation. It is not, for example, inherent to scientific research that it be conducted in laboratories or by certified scientists from certified institutions, in which producing knowledge is thought of as an activity distinct and separate from the practices in which it may be applied, and in which knowledge is produced that credentialed scientists, scientific experts then convey to those engaged in these practices, for example, to farmers, prescribing how their farming practices may be improved. Scientific research is often conducted in this way, perhaps always so, when the aim of research is said to be to produce techno-scientific innovations that serve commercial interests which in, these, in this text I'll be referring uh, only to the commercial interests of, of agribusiness. Agrotoxics and GMOs are among the products of this kind of science. Its methodologies are designed to investigate the underlying molecular structures of phenomena and objects, for example, of seeds and plants, the physiochemical mechanisms, laws expressing relations among quantities, and how control may be exercised and intensified by means of technical interventions. These methodologies dissociate from the context of the origins of the phenomena and from, from their uses and places in the life world. I call science that only uses such methodologies decontextualizing ones. They are used in disciplines such as molecular biology and biotechnology that inform high input agriculture and it informs many dimensions of today's dominant food system, which is structured by market-oriented industrial programs of food production and distribution and dominated by international agribusiness corporations. And the unfolding of this dominant system uh, progressively leads to diminished space for other kinds of agriculture. 
The methodologies of decontextualizing science, however, do not suffice to produce understanding of, ob of objects that are inseparable from their context. For example, sustainable agroecosystems and their possibilities, and the ecological, human, social conditions, consequences and risks of the commercial uses of GMOs, as well as of other phenomena where social structures, ecological and historical conditions an impact on and contributions from human beings are fundamental. However, in science policies today, increasingly in mainstream scientific institutions, and certainly in commercialized science, science tends to be identified with science that uses decontextualizing <coughs> methodologies. But science understood in this way cannot ad adequately address the question about food security. For doing so, for investigating food security involves investigating phenomena in the life world that are essentially contextualized. It should not be taken for granted that ready answers to it are available in mainstream science. Indeed, despite the widespread conviction, itself open to empirical investigation, that innovations informed by scientific research are necessary for economic development that supposedly contributes to the well-being of everyone, it should not be taken for granted that agro ag agricultural policies informed by decontextualizing science do not pose barriers to say, safeguarding food security for many people. Science should not be identified with decontextualizing science. Indeed, I would suggest and this is, of course, a summary statement, scientific research can be thought of as systematic empirical inquiry conducted using whatever methodologies and experiences are apt for gaining knowledge and understanding of the kinds of phenomena and objects being investigated and their full causal networks. In it, all claims, all hypotheses, are subject to empirical evidential testing where the evidence is obtained using methodologies and experiences appropriate in the light of what kinds of objects the claims are about. This incorporates science conducted under decontextualizing methodologies. For example, those of the, the methodologies of molecular biology, genetics, and biotechnology are indeed apt for investigating the technical possibilities of GMOs and their efficacy. But other kinds of methodologies are also needed to investigate the consequences of using GMOs in the life world, the causes of widespread hunger, and, for example, the possibilities and practices of programs of agroecology. Food security. Food security is a widely, widely recognized as a right in numerous international declarations. The Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, for example, refers to it as a situation that exists when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. Moreover, state signatories to the International Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights assume the legal responsibility to implement specific and effective programs to ensure the realization of this right progressively and as rapidly as possible for citizens who currently are not its beneficiaries. Identifying effective programs is not a matter to be settled by having good intentions, by believing that the only realistic efforts are uh, to solve the problem of food insecurity must involve techno-scientific innovations or by what serves economic, corporate, political, ethical, religious, cultural or personal interests. What is effective and what is not are matters to be appraised in the light of all the relevant kinds of empirical evidence. Evidence that the current food system is increasing production at a rate greater than popula population increase, for example, would not constitute compelling evidence that food insecurity is being diminished. Issues about the conditions of production and distribution 
and how the product is used, food for people, food for animals, agrofuels, have to be taken into account. Relevant evidence would have to be obtained in systematic inquiry that addresses, among other things, the causes of prevailing food insecurity and how a program's likely effectiveness compares with the potential effectiveness that well-supported competing programs might have. Decontextualizing methodologies, and therefore commercialized science, do not have the, method, uh, the, the resources needed for obtaining such evidence. The dominant form of the current food system is characterized by dependence on petrochemically derived inputs, mechanization, monocultures, hybrids, and increasingly by the use of GMOs, market orientation, and being dominated by large agribusiness corporations. It is not, in fact, securing the rights to food security for everyone. And evidence is accumulating that it is not doing so because of the functioning of some of its own mechanisms. The mechanisms derive from the system prioritizing profits and not the rights and well-being of everyone. More and more people are highly vulnerable to market variations and the shortages of food that can be caused by market-based decisions. For example, to grow crops for agrofuels or GMOs for export rather than foodstuffs for local consumption. People become more vulnerable in, often because they have been displaced from their lands and no longer able to produce their own food. And all of this is, is exacerbated by environmental and social disruption and the progressive elimination of the conditions for practicing alternative forms of farming. This rapid diagnosis of the persistence of food insecurity, of course, is not far from the last word, and it is hotly contested. However, it is a matter that cannot be settled without conducting further systematic inquiry. But if the diagnosis is correct, however, continuing the dominance of the current food system would not only fail to solve the problem in the long run, and perhaps intensify it, but also leave without redress the current situation of food insecurity. But this situation requires urgent redress. Thus it makes sense to secure spaces in which the possible possibilities of alternate food systems, which show promise of being able to implement and safeguard the right to food security more adequately, can be explored and their practices developed. I will now consider a specific proposed alternative food system, one that Dan mentioned this morning, based on the, the idea of food sovereignty. And then discuss the sort of investigation needed to compare its merits with those of the prevailing system. Food sovereignty is most associated with the movement La Via Campesina, an international network of movements of family and small-scale farmers, and it has the support of a growing number of academic agricultural scientists, and it is growing in influence in the deliberations and recommendations of international bodies linked with the United Nations, such as FAO. Food sovereignty... Uh, looks like not everything fits in, sorry about that, but food sovereignty is the aspiration or value for, farm, for family farmers and their communities, organizations and movements, in collaboration with other bodies and governments in their countries and regions, first to determine the form of their food system and to control all aspects of its functioning. Second, to produce sufficient and healthy food in culturally appropriate and ecologically sustainable ways, normally in or near their own locales. Three, to develop and to utilize and develop agroecological approaches to production. Four, to protect farmers' rights <coughs> to seed, land, water, and fair markets, as well as to strengthen their communities, livelihoods, and social 
and social and environmental sustainability. And five, the one you can't see there, is for the development of regional, national, and international policies that would democratize the administration of food systems and produce the, the, the fur, and further the realization of items one through four. Now, before proceeding with the argument, I would like to, I want to note that I'm speaking, <coughs> uh, that, that I'm speaking today from the point of view of, of engagement and commitment to, uh, to the values that lie behind the practices of the food sovereignty. I am part of a group of philosophers of science in Sao Paulo that has strong connections with the principal Brazilian partner of La Via Campesina, the movement uh, of the landless rural workers, and also with academic and professional agricultural scientists who are engaged in research and consultation practices connected with agroecology. So I, I want to stress that I'm not talking about something that I've just read about. I'm talking about something that I'm directly engaged in. I'm talking about values that I actually share. I believe this enhances the cognitive credentials of the proposals that will follow in the talk. Now, via La Via Campesina has proposed, proposal A, the policies, programs, and practices of food sovereignty hold the key to an alternative food system that, unlike the current one, could, <coughs> could over the long term, come to implement and safeguard the right to food security for everyone. That claim, that proposal, presupposes a number of things that I think they'll become, I mean, I'm missing a bit here, but I'll, I'll pick it up later. It presupposes a food system could be implemented, and here's important, with a multiplicity of complementary, locally specific, locally chosen, locally directed approaches to food production at its core that would simultaneously be highly productive of, nut uh, highly productive of nutritious foodstuffs, environmentally sustainable, and protective of biodiversity. <coughs> Strengthening of communities of rural people and the variations of their values and interests with place and culture applicable in context where the methods preferred by agribusiness have little applicability and so particularly well suited to contribute to food security by ensuring that rural populations would be well fed and nourished and able to resist the further consolidation of current patterns of hunger. And when accompanied by appropriate locally oriented distribution methods able to play a major role in producing the food necessary to feed the world's a growing pop feed and nourish the world's growing population. Now, that's a proposal or a claim. A hypothesis A is a hypothesis, if you like, uh, and it presupposes B, which has a multiplicity of claims and hypotheses built into it. And it means that my first question, which I keep up the top. Now, that sound answers to that first question, Q1, would incorporate answers to the more specific question, Q2. What kinds of scientific investigation uh, <clears throat> uh, could contribute to producing knowledge that could inform the multiplicity uh, of practices referred to in item B? And second, to appraising the potential for their development and expansion, <clears throat> uh, and whether that expansion would be sig significant enough to provide support for item A. These are investigations of phenomena and possibilities in the life world. Methodologies appropriate for them involve contact with the practitioners of food sovereignty and the experiences of its practitioners. Consequently, Investigators would need to be open to learning unfamiliar idioms and the possibilities that may be expressed in them. To be able to dialogue across cultural differences 
and to recognize that objects such as seeds and plants are simultaneously objects of many different kinds, whose possibilities cannot all be grasped within a single framework. There's no single framework that can capture the possibilities of seeds as objects that will grow into plants under certain conditions and their possibilities as objects subject to intellectual property rights. I will also suggest uh, <clears throat> well, sorry, some things are being cut off, but I don't think any of it's too important. Uh, I also want to suggest that answering this question Q2 is reciprocally intertwined with the question, how can the encounter with the aspiration and practices of food sovereignty enrich the ways in which scientific methodologies are conceived and utilized? Defending and strengthening food sovereignty and enriching the ways in which science is conceived and conducted, I believe, go hand in hand. This is just a summary of everything. There's my two questions again, and A and most of B is there. Now, I want to focus on, essentially, on uh, what will be item, uh, item one. Do I say one or two there? It doesn't matter. I'm focusing on item one of question two now. And you'll, you'll notice in B, agroecological practices were highlighted in item three of the account I gave of food sovereignty. And here I will focus exclusively on them. There's no time to look at all practices. Agroecology. Agroecology is, is used to designate, the term agroecology is used to designate both a type of farming practice and the scientific field that generates knowledge that can inform it. As practice, agroecology aims to achieve a balance among such dimensions of agroecosystems as productivity, sustainability, sustainability and protection of biodiversity, health of members of the farming communities and their surroundings, and strengthening of local people's culture and agency. The components of agroecosystems include what I call underlying objects, minerals and microorganisms in soils, genetic, physiological, and anatomical structures of plants, uh, bacterial and viral causes of diseases of plants and animals and many other things. They include objects of familiar experience, seeds, soils, plants, animals, insects, human beings, sources of water, buildings, division of agricultural fields, and also more or less self-regulating totalities, systems, ecosystems, social, economic, cultural systems. The origins of agroecology lie in traditional farming practices and it remains in continuity with them. Seeds used in agroecology, for example, unlike in conventional and, and GMO type farming, remain being both sources and parts of the farmers, the farmers harvested crops. And grain harvested from, in the crop, from the crops is both seed and foodstuff. Crop plants grown from seeds selected in traditional ways and contemporary refinements of them tend to be integral parts of sustainable agroecosystems that generate products that meet local needs and cultivating them is compatible with local cultural values and social organization. The seeds planted have been selected from crops harvested by the farmers themselves, for the most part. With, with procedures time-tested to nurture biodiversity and to produce new varieties that are suitable to grow in unfavorable soils, for example, excessively dry, mineral deficient, nitrogen depleted, waterlogged ones, and so on, and also in new and changing environments. Sometimes the effectiveness of selection methods is improved by techniques developed in the course of pharma-science collaboration. There is the so-called 
participatory breeding of crop plants that has enabled drought-resistant varieties of maize to be developed uh, in certain parts of Brazil using traditional methods of selection aided by techniques of genomic analysis. This is the so-called marker, uh, marker-aided selection that Dan talked about this morning. Agroecology agro as science investigates the agroecosystems in which agricultural production and the distribution of its products takes place. Their components and the possibilities they engender, often with the goal of informing improved methods of agroecological practice. The methods of agroecology need to be able to de deal with all the components of agroecosystems and relations among them. And so it is essentially an inter- and multidisciplinary field of investigation. It draws on at least ecology, sociology, psychology, economics, public health sciences, and up to a point political science, as well as on indigenous and traditional local knowledge that has met the test of time and traditional practices. In addition, for investigating what I have called underlying objects, <clears throat> there is an essential place for the decontextualizing methods of mainstream biological, chemical, and soil sciences. But other methodologies need to be apt for investigating, among other things, seeds as constituents of agroecosystems and, ob and as objects of value that may have economic, legal, cultural, aesthetic, cosmological, or religious significance. The results of, agro, of agroecological science are represented in organized bodies of knowledge, explanations, and encapsulations of possibilities. They include both generalizations and what I call local profiles. Generalizations about the tendencies, functioning, and possibilities of agroecosystems, their components and relations among them. B. Methods for reclaiming degraded lands. C. The conditions that make preservation of biodiversity more likely. Local profiles and historical narratives that serve as the basis for defining the balance desired by local communities among the various dimensions of agroecosystems. In order to procure empirical data that is relevant for generating and testing such results, the collaboration of farmers of researchers with farmers who work the ecosystems is essential. Farmers with their experience, their practical and observational skills, and improvisational experimental attitudes typically have a more complete grasp of the agroecosystems in which they work, the variety of their organic and inorganic components, their spatiotemporal varieties and variations in histories, of the practices that can be sustained and that maintain biodiversity in them, as well as of the interests, capabilities, values, and aspirations of the people in them whose values and cultures are to be strengthened. Consequently, sharp lines cannot be drawn between the researcher and the farming practitioner, between formally trained scientists and the bearers of traditional knowledge, and between practices of, of obtaining knowledge and the farming practices themselves. Agroecological practices can be improved by incorporating <coughs> input from research of the kind I've just briefly described. Thus, assessing the potential of, bio of agroecology needs to take into account the novel possibilities that are regularly opened up by engaging in this research. Now, before proceeding to, the, to deal with the, the second item in my question two, uh, it'll be helpful now to, uh, to have a, a fairly brief look at food sovereignty as a value and the values and its associated, the values that it carries within it and some of its associated values. The aspiration of food sovereignty 
I, I said at the outset, is for the sake of claiming the right to food security for members of the, the food sovereignty movements themselves and others similarly situated. Their own food security is precarious within the current food system, and they are experiencing that their means of producing food are progressively being undermined. Valuing food sovereignty does not provide a ground for holding that my, well, it's not there, the, the item A, the claim A, is correct. Remember, claim A is to claim that the practices of food sovereignty can solve the, the issues. So holding the values doesn't provide a ground for holding that that claim is correct. Although it does support that A should be rigorously investigated empirically with perhaps a measure of priority. Moreover, valuing food sovereignty does not presuppose that that claim A has already been vindicated. However, adherence to it is strengthened by the well-documented fact that the practices of food sovereignty, and particular agroecological practices, have actually provided for a small but growing number of farming communities the means to have the right to food security strengthened. And so by the fact that there are contexts in which the right to food security is not well served by the dominant food system, but in which the practices of food sovereignty actually have enhanced foods, food security. Unfortunately, I'm going to... Is, is there any way I can move this up, do you think? Uh, I, do. I don't know. Doesn't matter. Okay, we'll, we'll do it without it. <laughs> But it's, um, I think I've, no, I don't want that yet. <clears throat> Let me just try. No. Nope. I'll stay where I am. Okay. There's an item here. If I'll, I'll read it slow because it's going to be important. Because the fact that, what I, what I want to claim is the fact that the practices of food sovereignty have contributed to food security for certain communities does, doesn't provide evidence for A, my item A, but it does provide evidence for what I'll call A1. That is, the potential of the practices of food sovereignty to provide means for redressing food insecurity may be developed and expanded more extensively than it has been to date. Although, perhaps only for some groups in some contexts, but not for others. For example, it may not be applicable sufficiently for urban populations. How extensively remains open at present to be settled by the accumulating test of practice and empirical inquiry. Now that item, A1, that I claim is supported, provides a reason for adhering to the aspiration of food sovereignty <coughs> and for attempting to develop and implement its programs and practices and to investigate the conditions, if any, uh, under which the trajectory of development from A1, <coughs> currently achieved successes, is moving in the direction, the conditions that would facilitate moving in the direction of A being applicable for everyone, okay? It's, it's established that food sovereignty satisfies food security needs for some communities. They can be expanded. Can they be expanded to cover the food needs of everyone? That's, that's the claim of item A. That's what needs investigating. What are the conditions that might facilitate that movement from A1 to A? To identify what these conditions are, it is important to recognize that although aiming for, for, for food security is indispensable to it, the aspiration for food sovereignty does not derive simply from means ends considerations. This is very important. Food sovereignty is enmeshed in a more encompassing set of values that I call, uh, I think that's here, 
some of that. I should have shown that once. Sorry. Uh, food, it's enmeshed in a more encompassing set of values that I call the values of social justice, sustainability, popular participation, and universe, universal well-being. For simplicity, I'll just shorten that to values of, food, of social justice. To get at this, uh, uh, La Via Campesina maintains that the practices of food sovereignty, among other things, and he is getting some of the values, uh, teach respect for Mother Earth. I said you, we have to play with unfamiliar idiom sometimes. They are more sustainable. They depend on the agency of the farmers themselves, their intelligent initiatives, knowledge, perceptiveness, capacity to learn, to cooperate, and to make their own judgments and decisions. They require recovering ancestral farming knowledge, appropriating elements of agroecology and other means that strengthen their cultural and traditional heritages. Guarantee a life with dignity for themselves and future generations of rural people. Future generations is built in there. And contribute so, to the solution of food, climate, and other crises that currently confront humanity. I've written there, I mean, I could do a much more elaborate account of this, but there's no time uh, to do so today. However, I want to draw special attention to agency that's there, that depend on the agency, because the sovereignty of farmers, their communities and movements, and the enhanced agency required to claim and exercise it are at the heart of the aspiration of food sovereignty. Exercising agency is integral to human well-being, sort of in your talk before species being, right? It's uh, integral to human well-being. Human beings are agents, beings with capacities for self-consciousness, self-reflection, and self-determination, and for acting according to their own reflectively endorsed values and the goals and ideals they inform, and their own intelligent assessments of current realities. Agency, I believe, is the distinctive human capacity shared by all human beings. For its effective exercise, however, certain conditions are required. It can be enhanced or diminished by people's relations with others and their places in social institutions and by the relations they are able to maintain with the natural, biological, ecological environment. Effective agency is intertwined with uh, uh, with environmental sustainability, particularly when we think about future generations. And it and the relations of solidarity mutually reinforce one another so that agency is enhanced in vital communities. It is diminished, on the other hand, where dominant social institutions structure a society so that many people are excluded from roles in decision-making and from having secure access to the conditions needed to maintain well-being. Diminished agency is linked with the sense of being powerless and helpless, subject to the pushes and pulls of forces outside of one's control and often understanding, where one's own perceptiveness, values and agency can play little role in the unfolding of one's life and habitat. Hence the importance for people marginalized within, social, uh, within current social structures of enhancing their agency through their own leading participation in the communal practices and popular movements aiming to redress the suffering that they are experiencing and to assert their leading role in determining the conditions that shape their lives. The values of social justice, therefore, are incompatible with the values that are embodied in the institutions of capital and the market that are widely held throughout the world today and embodied in the dominant food system. The programs and practices of food sovereignty, where they are successfully established, at the same time that they aim to safeguard food security, both express and contribute to the further embodiment of the values of social justice. This is of fundamental importance. It is in large part because the programs and practices of food sovereignty both express 
and contribute to the further embodiment of the values of social justice, that they can, they can be entertained as possibly opening a path from A1 to A, from their current successes to the possibility of success across the board. That's just a summary of, of my questions in A and B. I'll just leave that there for the moment. Now the, the uh, item two of my, of my question two. The prospects for, food, for achieving food security cannot be satisfactorily dealt with using decontextualizing methodologies. Nevertheless, they remain open to empirical inquiry. To assess their prospects within the dominant food system would require inquiry that takes into account the socioeconomic mechanisms of the system and the values it embodies, its history, and the stance of domination towards nature that it incorporates. To assess the prospects within the context of the programs and practices of food sovereignty would involve first assessing whether available evidence supports not only A1, but also the absence of significant limits to the effective expansion of the practices of food sovereignty. And second, identifying the socioeconomic conditions that would have to be established in order to take significant steps from A1 towards A. One certainly cannot rule out at the present time, A, that research will show that conditions, for example, labor intensiveness, needed for agroecological farming and, and the distribution of its products, for example, markets, cannot be created on the scale a large scale that would be needed to supply sufficient food for large cities. And B, that the multiplicity of complementary, locally specific, locally chosen, locally directed approaches referred to in item B that it, uh, may include among its components some elements of conventional and GMO intensive farming. When I talk about this multiplicity of methods, I like to talk about the space of, agri of agricultural alternatives, the range of possible approaches to agriculture, so that term, the space of, in, uh, of, of alternatives. And we also can't rule out that in some societies, uh, uh, conventional or GMO forms of farming you know, might be preferred as the basis of the of the local, the local farm system. That's certainly not ruled out a priori in this mode of thinking. It is up to democratic decision making and democratic decision making might in certain societies such as our own, they might make that kind of choice. I should mention that in addition to agroecology, other components of the space of alternatives or in addition to agroecology agro and conventional and GMO methods, other components of the space of alternatives include organic, subsistence, biodynamic, permaculture, ecologically sustainable, the system of rice intensification, indigenous approaches, and many others, including some that are adapted to urban environments. Uncertainty about these matters, however, uncertainty about the extent to which movement from A1 to A may or may not be possible, this uncertainty or personal skepticism does not provide a reason to refrain from exploring the potential of agroecology to expand, to develop new methods and modes of organization for its practices and to be deployed in new contexts, including urban ones, with new participants. Yeah, I think that's right here. It doesn't need to be definitely settled now whether or not the programs and practices of food sovereignty 
could contribute eventually to safeguarding food security generally. That's the goal, the hope, if you like, but it doesn't have to be settled now that it's possible. Expanding the range of successes of agroecology now contributes to safeguarding food security for more people, even if there are definite limits to its potential expansion. No one thinks that expanding the programs and practices of food sovereignty can safeguard food security generally without developments that would require time, resources and preparation of farmlands, new public policies and the formation of practitioners. These practices could not, even if desired, replace the current food system as it were tomorrow. Meanwhile, the potential of, of food sovereignty programs could be explored, giving priority to developing them in places where the right to food security currently is not safeguarded, and whatever limits there may be to the scope of A1 would be tested in the process. Thus something important would be gained and nothing important lost, except that the interest of some players in the dominant food system would be thwarted. If insuperable limits to the expansion of food sovereignty were to be found, so be it. It's still valuable to engage in the programs and practices wherever they work and people want to follow them. And who knows, perhaps in the long run, a relatively stable way of integrating them with, the, with a modified version of the current system could be found. This is really where this slide comes in now. The issues involved here are not restricted to biological, technological and economic ones. To explore the, the possible limits of A1 requires methodologies that can take into account the potential causal impact of the dual motivations that I discussed safeguarding food security and embodiment, embodiment of the values of social justice. The aspiration of food sovereignty can be realized only if farmers are motivated to adopt its practices. And strong motivation is required, for the obstacles to developing food sovereignty programs and practices are great and cannot be overcome simply by receiving better technical advice about how to use the latest innovations. Sometimes the obstacles appear to be overwhelming. For example, the seemingly unstoppable thrust of agribusiness and industrial farming that would claim all arable land for their practices. The fear that the interests of capital in the market will tolerate no competitors and use their power to destroy or marginalize any attempts to compete. And this is very important, the costs of the transition to agroecology, difficulties of access to the required kinds of seeds, uh, and the fact that the knowledge to manage sustainable ecosystems has actually been lost in many places. Holding the values of social justice is the key source of hope that an alternative path may be viable, and the unleashing of agency, imagination, intelligence, perceptiveness, and the possibilities that are opened up by effective solidarity that comes with it can generate the capacity to confront the obstacles, to seek for new solutions to the problems confronted, to be open to recognize new roles for participants, to gain new participants, and, and to uh, gain new adherents, uh, and to push claims, effectively claims, for obtaining public support. Committed action, organization, aiming towards expanding the scope of A1, itself creates conditions for further expansion and attracting new adherents that could not come, that could not have been foreseen beforehand. I want to say that hope expressed in commitment and solidarity can have causal consequences. Hope does not guarantee certainty of success or provide evidence that success is a general possibility. Hope is not a substitute for evidence, but without it, expanding the practices and programs of food sovereignty so that they can contribute generally to the safeguarding of food security for everyone is simply not a possibility. Those who insist, often claiming the authority of science, that there are no possibilities for meeting the food needs of everyone unless they be within the dominant food system, 
ignore the potential effects of hope. They also do not take into account research that addresses the space of alternatives. Yet, if science is to be able to gain understanding of, to use the hackneyed word, phrase, the world we live in, it must deal with all the causal factors operating in this world, and hope is one of them. Investigation, which does take the potential causal role of hope into account, supports that the programs of food sovereignty can contribute to expanding the scope of A1. It does not settle, however, whether or not that expansion could eventually result in vindicating A. We can do better with these methods, whether we can do enough to deal with everyone is still an open question. Settling that would require engaging in the practice of food sovereignty and empirically mon monitoring their outcomes, locale by locale, and finding out over the long haul what, if any, their significant limits may be. No doubt, many in the scientific mainstream would not consider investigation of that kind a high priority. The proponents of food sovereignty, however, see themselves as confronting the choice, either to be resigned to a life marked by food insecurity and not shaped by the values that, that their agents hold, or to engage in the struggle for food sovereignty. I'll repeat, holding the values of social justice does not guarantee that the practices of food sovereignty can result in abolishing food insecurity for everyone, but it can nourish the hope and the committed action that it engenders that is a key causal factor in expanding the applicability of food sovereignty. Now, to conclude, I'm going to... I did have some other stuff I didn't think I'd have time for, and I don't, so... To conclude, I'm just going to offer you a set of aphorisms, because I don't have time to develop the arguments for any of them, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I hope they'll be suggestive. <laughs> They're aphorisms concerning the, uh, the role of adhering to the values of food sovereignty. I mean, first to implementing food, uh, I mean, to taking care of food security, but also the whole gamut of the values that I talked about. The first aphorism is that addressing empirically questions about the embodiment of the values of food sovereignty does not presuppose or imply adherence to the values. You can investigate these questions whether or not you adhere to the values. They're open to inquiry. Two, answers to these questions are to be appraised in terms of how well they manifest the cognitive values in the light of available empirical data and of the adequacy of the data, for they refer to claims about matters of fact. Adhering to the value of safeguarding food security, for example, or the values in general that I'm talking about, does not provide evidence for any proposed answer. In my argument, in my analysis, fact is not being derived from value. Three, the ethical, social, and I believe even cognitive importance of my first question, the question uh, about how to satisfy food security, interpreters involving answers to my second longer question, uh, derives from adherence to the values of food sovereignty. And, of course, the ethical and social importance of that question goes hand in hand with ent entering into the practices and therefore obtaining data that are important, that are pertinent to answering the questions in empirically responsible ways. If we don't enter into the practices, we'll never have the data that's relevant to evaluating. Four, I put it, adherence to the values then leads to judgments <coughs> of the importance of phenomena and practices that in turn opens up, makes one aware of the role of the methodologies needed to investigate those phenomena. The, invest, the phenomena of agroecology, the phenomena of, involved in expansion, expanding the role of A1. Hence, adherence to values is part of the causal explanation 
of certain kinds of knowledge having been obtained and others not. Adhering to values, therefore, can have causal consequences that may include obtaining knowledge of certain kinds that may not, have been, may not be obtained otherwise. It may lead to obtaining the evidence that supports certain factual claims. Support to getting the evidence, but it's not as such a ground for holding the factual claim. And finally, number five, far from introducing bias into science, so long as it does not claim hegemony and deny a role to other values, this leads to a richer sense of the range of scientific methodologies and a firmer commitment to insist on results obtained from using the proper range of methodologies in public policies deliberation. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Questions for Lisa? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think at, uh, at one point in the presentation you said that um, the sovereignty might um, operate uh, on like non-market principles, um, and I was wondering if you could just give some some details about those alternatives. Right. Yes. Well, uh, I mean, it doesn't mean it won't be markets. <laughs> I mean, sure. but, I mean, uh, Stuff has to be sold and so on, but the emphasis is on the is on the locality. I mean, to the extent possible, and, and sort of standard notions of agriculture for exporting and so on. Um, you know, are secondary. I mean, yes, if you grow a lot, you may under certain conditions, you know, sell it elsewhere. But the emphasis is is upon the local. So that first of all, it's uh, communities feeding themselves, not having to buy food. Uh, secondly, selling it in in the local neighborhoods. Um, uh, things like, I mean, some of the practices are, are becoming in common in, in, uh, in the United States, like uh, 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 community farmer relationships, and, you know, having farmers markets to sell to specific communities or producing food in ways that for certain groups that's been worked out. Uh, in, in advance. Um, it's not, uh, this is the one part of, of, of the practices that I'm the weakest on. <laughs> uh, I, I should point out, I mean, they're, they're, they're very important, but, but the groups that I've seen with, they, their products, it, it, it's this local emphasis, the local market, well, well first of all, that, that feeding themselves is is crucial because they don't have to buy then. So if the prices go up, it doesn't affect them. You know, that's crucial. The other thing that's becoming much more common is for <coughs> entering into agreements with or, uh, contracts with with governments, local, state, and other, to provide food for public institutions. You know, like the food for schools will come from them. The food for, for Prisons will <laughs> come from, from hospitals and things like that. So that there are. This has the advantage of uh, there being guaranteed markets, and so you know they're not susceptible to the same volatility of, uh, of, uh, of market variation and uh, you know, the lowering of prices when there's lots of stuff and things like that. And so it, it's a kind of a just like I've stressed the multiplicity of forms of. Production uh, there's a multiplicity of forms of, of distribution uh, that will have great variation locale by locale. I mean, they'll be very different in places where people have cars and when people don't have cars. For example, you can't go far when you don't have when you don't have cars, uh, or and so on. But anyhow, that's a gesture in the direction of, uh, of answering your question. Yeah. Oh, I was, uh, uh, um, so in the beginning you had uh, some lists, a list of uh, underlying objects and a, and a list of objects of familiar experience, mm -hmm. and uh, buildings were in the object of familiar right. experience, but machines weren't. 
And actually, in your talk, I said including. In your talk, you don't say a lot about the impact of machines and technology on the possibility of food sovereignty. And so if you think like of kibbutzim in Israel, that they, it's sort of the practice that they have, but it's a very high tech situation. And so whether or not different places can achieve this is very much maybe linked to technology. And those technologies are part of, the way they develop are often part of decontextualized science, which is then imported and then tested out in context. So could you talk about that a little bit? Well, first, no, I did want to, I mean, I think I said that didn't emphasize that decontextualized science can't be ignored. It's part of the mix of methodologies needed, partly for the reason you stated, which I'll come back to, and partly because many of the objects in hydraulic systems, we would know about viruses and bacteria, so on, but for decontextualized science. So it's not, this isn't an argument against decontextualized science, it's an argument for locating it in a bigger framework. But you're right, I didn't mention machines, and that actually is a, a misleading omission, because for the reason you just stated, that's important. I was going to say in the previous talk, when there was discussion of intermediary technologies, in Brazil, there's a movement called the movement of social technology, and they've had an enormous discussion about the issue of intermediary technologies and high, and high technologies. And the point is, yes, that small tractors are very important in certain circumstances, but so are the things like the enhancement of selection processes using genetic markers and so on, which is very high tech kind of thing. Most agroecological communities that have developed a bit have solar panels, you know, producing electricity. I mean, it's very high tech. They do, there is, it's an international movement. There is, communities have their computers. I mean, you can't have international learning without some means of, they can't get in airplanes and travel places. They don't have time for that, but they can do these things. And what's important here, so you're right, these are a product of decontextualizing science, and I don't want to, or I don't want to diminish that, and it was a lapse that I didn't mention machines. What's important in this is control. You know, the technology of the genetic markers, by probably some fate, some accidental reason, hasn't been patented. So it's cheap. Local agricultural scientists can interact with them and utilize those methods. Whatever one thinks of the GMOs, you can't use GMOs without being in relationship with, I mean, we're dealing with intellectual property rights of various kinds. Local control is not possible when there are those sorts of things. So yes, that's important. And what the limits of that are, we'll find out as time goes. But then there are other kinds of machines that are important. One, I was just on a doctoral examining committee of someone who did a study of an agroecological development in a very dry part of the northeast of Brazil. A crucial component of the thing were underground, what do you call them, things that hold water tanks, underground tanks from unique pumps. Machines, I mean, without a certain kind of modicum of machinery, these things don't function. So your point is well taken, and I agree. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, so there have been some scholars recently uh, that argue that the agricultural revolution was in fact something of a disaster for human beings, right? It brings on famine and ill health and standing armies and things like that. So um, I guess I have two questions. One is, why should I believe that um, this mode of production, right, this sort of set of technologies will engender a uh, better set of values uh, than, you know, the available alternatives? Um, but second, you know, if I'm going to cast my eye back over history and sort of decide uh, where I'd like to live, I mean, somebody might say, why not go for more nomadic techniques, why not sort of return to a hunter-gatherer lifestyle or something like that? Certainly we'd see equality, we'd have local control of conditions and things like that, um, and probably we could uh, better counter something like population growth using such a method. Well, I don't want to miss a priori rule anything out. I mean, because local control is is the key to think. And if uh, in, in certain regions decisions were made of, of that kind, it would be consistent with it. Uh, it's unlikely, in my in my judgment, because again, like it or not, we the world has moved on. Most people live in countries that have governments, <laughs> and uh, and Governments are not likely to uh, to, you know, to go along with with practices that don't contribute in a in a to, for example, to, I mean, to pr pr provision of food that's sufficient for the whole country and things of uh, things of that kind. But it's important though not to rule out. Maybe there is a, a one argument, one. Big debate that's happening in Brazil concerns the role of, uh, of, of uh, indigenous peoples work in the, in the Amazon region, and uh, there's very good evidence that the Amazon, where it's the where the indigenous people work it, is much more sustainable. Um, there's much more greater biodiversity in it than than in other regions, and so. It is important to uh, uh, to incorporate certain certain traditional practices and to maintain because they're doing a role that's really crucial in the, <coughs> serving the, the role of keeping the forest, you know, uh, today. But this to me is a, is a case by case kind of thing, and uh, these people, in turn, the uh, I mean, the native peoples who are working in the forest, you know, they, they have um, cell phones in their pockets. <laughs> uh, also, I mean, modern technologies are, you know, are part of, uh, of the environment that they're, that they're into now, and I don't think it's likely that, that I mean, they don't have them. It's not, it's not a necessity for them to have a cell phone. <laughs> uh, it's a convenience. They, they chose to uh, to do so, and so uh, I mean, so my answer really is I I mean some specifics I I can't see how there would be any role for them, but I I don't want to bring any a priori judgments into that because I I don't know it's for local control and not for certainly not for uh, for people from the first world to. Uh, you know, to figure out for the people there what would be the would be the better way uh, the better way to do things and even something like population control I mean, I mean obviously we, there is a population problem I mean, that's that's perfectly clear that it's uh, there's not a population problem in the Amazon <laughs> and uh, we don't need to introduce practices to take care of that and uh, well, no, I was worried that the introduction of traditional farming practices tends to grow families quite large right? mm -hmm. because you need additional children because of all the labor involved. So my concern was, actually, if we move to the kinds of practices that you were talking about, um, we have less efficient modes of production, more need to create um, children, right, to work the land. And well, so we why, why, why would we have less efficient ways of production? Because traditionally, one of the um, 
because traditionally agriculture has grown in population at twice the rate of nomadic communities. Well, agriculturalists have children every four years by necessity because they have to maintain standing armies and they have to uh, have additional labor to work the land that they, they make use of. Mm. Right, but not all countries have standing armies. Uh, you know, that and those that do, I mean, certainly the Brazilian army doesn't draw much from the agricultural sector. It draws from the... I mean, I just the, in, in, in traditional in, modes in, of... Uh, yeah, but we're not talking about... The, uh, agroecology is not a traditional mode. It's, it's a, a highly modern mode of production that has its origins in traditional things, but it is, it, it, it's developed and incorporated all sorts of features, including the results of uh, uh, the results of research, and even see labor intensive. It's certainly labor intensive. That, but look, in the United States, think of the unemployment. Why are people worried about labor intensive things being labor intensive? It would be great if we had more of them in this country. I mean, it's uh, um, and, and that's not the population. Problem. I mean, people. There were people who were working in this country seven years ago who aren't working today who want to work. I mean, uh, we're not producing for them. And one of, one of the fascinating things in this, this thesis I examined, uh, one of uh, the people in the community were talking about what were the advantages of Agroecology. One of the advantages was precisely that it's labor intensive. Why? Because that means that their children could stay there, work, and not have to go and live in the slums in the city and live a miserable, a miserable kind of life. So, what from one eye sort of looks inefficient in the fact that when, when we have the attitude of, of uh, that developing institutions for certain human well-being and uh, the species being that 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 kind of thing we have it for that and not for to, to serve uh, you know, efficiency as defined in economic terms. This is highly efficient. I mean more people are, uh, I mean I, um, the slums of the big cities are awful places to live and there's a lot of unemployment in them, and uh, and the employment that there is is awful in many, in most most of the time. Uh, working collectively in a, in these projects is a it is is a much richer way of being, particularly when it's being done in an environment where, if I put it, in, in intelligence is being cult cultivated, where people are are understanding. The whole process in which they're involved, reflecting on it, experimenting with it, developing in new in new ways. It, it, it's an occasion. I mean, it becomes a mode of life that has a that has a human richness to it, even if it is economically inefficient. But it turns out it isn't economically inefficient, at least at the scale it's developed. So far, I have acknowledged we don't know. Whether these practices can grow, so that they could feed people in, in large cities, you know, we just don't know. Uh, at this point, it's far. Uh, Richard Lewington, who someone else mentioned in the talk today, uh, he, he constantly makes the point that conventional and other forms of, of agriculture, you know, have been assisted by research for a hundred years. Uh, agroecological approaches have had people engaged in serious research for 20 years and a very small number of, of, of people. So it's very hard to compare the productive potential of something that's been under investigated for a shorter time with something that's been highly investigated with great investments over a, over a longer over a longer time. And the thing is, and, and what are you producing in, in in Brazil? The biggest export of Brazil nowadays is uh, is GMO soy. Uh, 
What's DNO soy? It's beautiful. I mean, it's, it's grown in monoculture, huge expanses, by large, in, in large farms, with a small body of a lot of people, but not employing many people, and uh, with a few people re reaping, the, reaping the benefits uh, of it. And the people who used to be on the land that's now being grown, these monocultures all were shunted off to the cities. And uh, or at least they begin there, living there in, uh, in slums. But by growing the monoculture, you know, ag agroecology doesn't grow monocultures, it doesn't just produce, I don't know if it grows soy, it, it doesn't just produce wheat or corn, but lots of other vegetables and stuff at the same time. So it produces a a balanced diet, and so certain sources of sickness, you know, don't, don't arise in it. And certainly, compared with you know, people in slums, are very unhealthy places. But also, well functioning agroecological systems are, are not, I mean, they're, they're very healthy places, and so on. So, I think it's uh, there's a lot of skew things. I mean, in, in the terms of the economics textbooks, I'm sure they're not efficient. But in terms of uh, ensuring the, the well-being of the participants in, in the full blood of the mean, health and, and their agricultural practice are, are deeply intertwined in this situation. And, uh, and education gets integrated with it too. I mean, the kids, they don't, um, they'll, they'll learn a lot of mainstream stuff too, but they'll also learn um, the, the basic generalizations and, and terms of understanding of, of agroecosystems. Also, uh, kids in our schools don't learn that. Okay. It's, uh, and, uh, so it's hard to, uh, I mean, to make the, the comparison. But I go back to the fact that the people who are deeply involved in this, the people who are doing them, are the ones, they have the choice. It's this or resignation to a life that is that has no hope in it. I mean that's what it is. So from from them, from their point of view, and so from the outside, you know, if, if someone says, Oh look, I'm not convinced that this is going to be efficient and so on, I mean I will vote against I mean I'll be against governments giving support to it and so on. This is actually to I mean to the uh, create uh, further in the conditions that will that drives more and more of these people into uh, into wretched conditions and removes conditions of hope. And that's why I stress hope. You know, it's it's the, it's a major variable in the in the activities of I mean in the, in the way these movements uh, uh, unfold. But that way, the way there's no chance. <laughs> Eric. Yeah, just a quick question with respect to your uh, question one on your um, slides. I like the point that you make that effectiveness has to be assessed in light of all the relevant evidence, and so you're going to have a myriad different <coughs> methodologies to assess this question, any particular question, like GMO or something like that. So what you get out of that is this really helpful sort of synoptic perspective on um, effectiveness. But there's a cost as well. The cost is um, this sort of difficult question of how to how to, how to combine these very, very different sort of ways of engaging with the world. So you have a toxicological way of engaging with the world, and there's an ecological way of engaging with the world, epidemiological ways, and um, uh, farming ways to engage with the world. And you're saying, well, you've got to assess effectiveness based on all of these. I was just wondering if you have any um, particular thoughts or recommendations about the nature of sort of um, aggregating evidence, whether evidence ranking schemas or, um, you know, some people are really prioritizing uh, randomized control trials or these sorts of things, but is that a difficulty that arises with the, the breadth of your um, recognition? Right. And, and this is, I mean, and, I mean, your question is a real one. It, it's not one that's that's directly confronted because none of these these movements uh, have any near uh, 
enough power to be integral parts of policy formation where you have to make decisions about putting stuff down here or there and, and, and whatnot. But that doesn't mean it's not a, a real question. But I, I do want to, to stress that, but of course, when there are multiple criteria and when you, you have multiple goals, there are going to be trade offs. And uh, there will be different trade offs in, in different societies. I mean, different, different communities will want to trade things off in, uh, in, in, in different ways. And uh, so somehow the, the management of it all in the larger scheme has to be uh, uh, has to be compatible with that. And so I often think that I don't probably some of you are familiar with this, but it's a way of getting at there. So a traditional Mexican way of growing corn, where corn, beans, and squash are grown together. And it's, I mean, the corn grows up, the beans, you know, twirl around the corn stalk, and so they get their sound, but the beans also put nitrogen into the soil. And the squash uh, keeps away certain bugs. <laughs> so it's a, it's a nice integrated system. Now, the people said, look, the monoculture, the corn grows more corn than that. And of course it does. But the monoculture of corn only grows corn, it doesn't grow the beans and the squash. And, and so, how does one compare? I mean, there are some interesting, there's a fellow named Altieri in California who did these wonderful experiments. I'll simplify the presentation, but he, he got two lots of three acre crops. In one, he grew the monoculture of corn, three acres of corn. In the other, he grew this uh, Mexican method that the crops intertwined. And the result was, of course, <coughs> there was more corn produced. <laughs> but uh, the corn produced in the, in the mixed cropping was more than a third the quantity of that produced in the, in the monoculture, that would I mean, significantly more, in fact. The, the beans were a bit more than if you plant another a, a monoculture of beans, just a bit more, but it was a bit. The squash was the same. Why? I have no idea, but uh, I mean, that wasn't explained in the, uh, in the article. But how do you compare that sort of, I mean, what, if you're a farmer and only have access to the product of the monoculture, you don't have dietary deficiencies. When you have a multiplicity of stuff, that's going to take care of you. So, so if, if you have a defective diet, you likely to have to have medical attention. If you don't, you won't have to the same extent the other way, and so on. So, I, I don't know how you compare the efficiency of, um, of, of these things. And I think if you're thinking in economic terms, uh, you're almost certainly very for the monoculture and its methods because they're generalizable. You can think about the same thing being implemented all around the place and stuff like that. But um, looking at it though from the point of view of human well-being, uh, the, mix, the mixed bag is, uh, is preferable. Now, as I said, how you would turn that into a, sort of a, a public policy where you have to make fine discriminations between money for this and money for that, I, I don't know the answer for that. So, again, I see this as a, 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 as a problem that will, when scale gets high enough, it will be involved. It's, it, I, again, I, since I did. I'm familiar with this mainly in Brazil, but there, there, there's been sufficient development of agroecology in Brazil that it can't be ignored at the levels of, of government. And so uh, the government has implemented a, a national program for agroecology. And it's said that in, in, within 15 years, 10% of, of Brazilian agriculture is to be agroecology. Now, that's 10% I and mean, the rest is all sorts of GMOs being, you know, for, and so on. It's, it, it, this is integrated. It's not a grand 
panacea, but it's the beginning of, of, of thinking about how these things could be incorporated into, uh, into policies about food and agriculture. Okay. Um, so there was one thing, I don't know, a handful of slides in, I'm not quite sure what slide it was, where we got a sort of gesture at the values of social justice. Yeah. And there were four of them. Uh, well, there were the values of social justice, dot, 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 which were shorthand for four things. Right. Um, the social, the justice, social justice, social justice sustainability. sustainability, popular yeah. participation, and universal well being. Yes. Right. Now, it seemed to me, uh, putting on my moral philosopher hat, that some of these were just instrumental to others, some of them were intrinsically valuable, some of them were probably parasitic on the other, and I was wondering, and you said, well, I don't have time to spell this out, but I was wondering if I could just offer some time to spell out a little bit more what you have said, because, yeah, one, one way of thinking of it is sustainability might only be instrumentally valuable to say, well, be or social justice, right? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe so too, depending on your theory of democracy, political participation might only be valuable at getting it well being or something. So I'm just, just curious. Right. You know, when I said I, I, I sort of made it quantitatively. I, I mean, I've got an enormous list of, of, of values that you find in the, the documents there. Now, your question is a different. I mean, I wouldn't have answered your question. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's an interesting. It's an interesting question. See, that in I mentioned that food security was was sort of as it were the starting point, but at the same time, the whole thing isn't just means ends. It's not just what means for this. It gets sort of intertwined in this in this well, I used to be meshed in this um, in this network of, of values, and within within the network. Yes, there are, there, some will be, if you like, more fundamental than others. On the other hand, I think there are much more complex dialectical relations that, that happen too. I mean, take uh, sustainability, for, for example. Now, sustained, uh, uh, sustainability is, you know, is instrumental for maintaining land that can be used for food production over the generations, for example, so it's instrumental for just for for food security. Uh, on the other hand, uh, sustainability is linked with other modes of interacting with uh, with interacting with nature, which are different from the emphasis on control and domination that's that's become common in the West. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a way of being to uh, uh, to uh, cultivate nature, to preserve nature, to enjoy nature. You know, there, there are a multiplicity of relations of, of this kind, and, but some of those relations, you know, nature is is a good, you know, just as as such. It's conceived, of, and so. Preserving that wood is in turn instrumental to preserving to preserving other woods. And as far as I know, in, in the in the interaction in the literature of the food sovereignty movement that I come across and can't say I I I haven't found any moral philosophers in the, in the thing no to I mean who would uh, Address these things, but I think one will find that that sort of emphasis on the the dialectical intermeshing is more likely to be where they are. And so it came to kind of this sustainability to be foregone if such and such. I mean, the, the, the intertwining I think would, would sort of foreclose that as a precise question. But the question would be rather concerned with modes of sustainability under what conditions. Things of, things of that kind. But I'll think more about that. I, I have to say, I never put on a moral philosopher's hat in, <laughs> in, in, in thinking about this, I've only had my philosophy of science hat on. I think uh, before we go secure ourselves some food, we should thank Professor Thank you. Thank you.